Drama-free relationships, do they exist? Today's dating scene is more complicated than ever, especially with social media, texting, and the endless pressure of the world's expectations. We'll learn how to navigate through the confusion and discover the freedom that comes from living a virtuous life. Sarah Swafford is the founder of Emotional Virtue Ministries and speaks to teens and young adults about how to live a drama-free life. She runs EmotionalVirtue.com and lives in Atchison, Kansas with her husband and children. After her presentation, please stay tuned for an important invitation. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good? Yeah? I just come to you in the name of, oh my gosh, I don't know how you're doing it, getting through college right now. When I was, a couple of years back, I was a dorm mom. Do you guys know like a house mom? Do you guys have that? Um, and I lived, my husband and Thomas and Fulton were one and two, like really little. Um, and my husband and the boys and I, we all lived in a freshman women's hall, 142 freshman women. And uh, for three years, I was the dorm mom. Um, my husband, our last name is Swafford, so people call him like Swaff, Swaff Daddy, P. Diddy Swaff, you know, whatever. You, you can call me Swaff Mama or Mama Swaff, like we'll go by it all. So if I say Swaff, it's my husband Andy. So the Swaffs lived like right there in that apartment and everyone goes, oh, so you got to know the women really well. It's like, where there are 142 women, there are at least 142 men. Amen? Right? I got to know the men and the women really well. And it was so fun because girls would come to me and like, we talk about life and guys would come to Andy or the couples would come to us and we just were doing everything we could. And we called our couch the therapy couch and we would just lay people down and just spoon feed them cookie dough and be like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I swear to you, it's going to be okay. And so throughout the three years, I got a front row seat to just what was going on. And the reason why I say I don't know how you do it is because my husband, Andy, and I, we got engaged, you know, dated, engaged, married, all of it before Facebook, you know, before Twitter, before texting, before all social media. It all came out like right after we got married. And the reason why I don't know how you do it is because in the dorms, I was watching this all play out and I was like, whoa, like this will forever change dating. Amen. Has dating changed? I talked to this dad. He had eight kids. The first four went through dating in high school and all that with like the home phone that hung on the wall, you know, remember those way back when home phone, home lines. And then the other four had cell phones and he was telling me how the phone would ring and like, you know, his like daughter or whatever would go and pick it up. And he knew who she was talking to, what they were talking about, you know, like who the main love interest was, you know, he knew it all. And then cell phones came and he's like, the other four, I didn't know who they were talking to. I didn't know who they were interested in. I didn't know who had just broken up with who. It was all a mystery to him. Social media, it's all changed. And the problem is, is dating is changing, 21st century dating, right? But we're all the same. We share humanity, yeah, praise God. But are men and women different? I'm sorry, are men and women just a little bit different? Yes. I really love it because I always say, <laughs> women, do men care? is so good. The men always answer yes, right? The women are like hesitant. They're like, um, women, do men care? No. Men, are women kind of complicating or confusing? Just a little frustrating sometimes. Oh, now you woke up. Now you're here. It's so cute. Cause like, are women complicating? And all the guys are like, who is around to elbow me? And I always love it. Cause I was like, women are, are men, like do men care? And everyone's like, no, there are no good guys anywhere. I'm going to die alone with a hundred cats. Do I know you or do I know you? <laughs> we miss each other sometimes. And the world's idea perfect messes with you and it messes with men and women differently. For the women, world's idea perfect. You have to be like a size negative two, like long legs, big doe eyes, you know, like perfect wardrobe hair, killer lips and hips, right? Ladies, we talked about that earlier. And you know, if you can't figure this out, there are at least 1,000 Pinterest videos to help you out. Like, <laughs> what would we do without it, right? I don't know what I'd do without it. I couldn't cook, that's for sure. Um, so you have to have what? The perfect group of friends in your profile picture and your cover picture and trophy boyfriend and all the girls want to be you, all the guys want to be with you and everyone knows it. World's idea perfect, right ladies? And for the men, I always get this image of like a rapper in a white tux with like a grill, gold grill and like shades and he's standing on a car and there's like women crawling up his legs and he's just like stacks of cash laying everywhere and he's just like fist pumping like this. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's Pitbull, right? It's Pitbull. Who doesn't want to be Pitbull? Thank you. This girl's like, I would rather not be Pitbull. That would be. <laughs> so 
the guys have to be chiseled and charming, you know, like the perfect, the perfect ideal boyfriend, Channing Tatum, whatever, right? The ladies are like fill in the blank. Guys have to be like in control, never fail at anything, successful at everything. And, you know, trophy girlfriend, beautiful girl. All the guys want to be you, all the girls want to be with you, and everyone knows it. It's the world's idea perfect. Here's the problem. We sit there and we look at celebrities and we're like, Pipple has $50 million. And he's just, he's good, right? He just tan and go to the gym and do laundry all the time, right? Like he just has his life. Good for him. And all the ladies, like we go through the magazine aisles and you're like, the model's heads are three times the size of their bodies. And we're like, okay, Photoshop exists. Like we don't have that luxury. Good for them. But here's the problem. The world's idea perfect. There's a buffer with every, you know, celebrities and stuff. But then you lay in bed at night at 1130 and you scroll on your phone and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. And it's not celebrities. It's your best friends. It's the people you see every day. And the thoughts that come over you are, I don't have that. I'm not with him. I'm not with her. I don't have that. That's not my reality. And this feelings of worthlessness, the insecurities, the feeling of alone, like it's just right there. And it's at every age, you guys. It's not just you. It's not just high school. It's not just college. It's forever. Because the world likes to mess with you. Even the media likes to mess with you. Think about all great girl media, you know, like, like all the love songs and the chick flicks, you know, it's like this two hour emotional roller coaster. Like, are they going to get together? I don't know. Of course they are, but we're going to watch all four hours, right? You know, and, and it's like so great. And the you know, men have their, you know, all their outlets, like something typically blows up every six or seven minutes. And there's like partial nudity, if not a full on sex scene. And all the girls are like, please get me out of here. And all the guys are like, this is great. It's like, yeah. You know, like they always say women are typically more turned on by what they hear and men are more turned on by what they see. And, um, one time I said this in a talk and this guy stood up and was like, excuse me, ma'am, men are turned on by all their senses. And I'm like, oh, I stand corrected. Men are turned on by all their senses. Maybe just what they see is like the predominant one. And so like, yes, got you. I, I stand corrected. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. The media knows how to mess with you. So not only do you have the world's idea perfect breathing down your neck, but you have this like intense pressure to date someone, this intense pressure from the media to be with someone, to be someone and to be with someone. The lady that cuts your hair, your sweet grandmother, everyone, every question, college students. So are you seeing anyone right now? You're like, do you want to be punched in the face? Like, (laughs) is that your goal for right now? Like, are you tired of it? I mean, I know I've been there. We've all been there. But this whole desire, this like status that you have to be dating someone, you have to be with someone. Do they know it's pretty complicated? Is it kind of frustrating? Not only are we missing each other, but we have all of this breathing down our necks. So the fact that men and women miss each other sometimes, this talk is to help us kind of maybe meet and talk and start a conversation. It's really funny when I give talks to the men. Uh, They typically start out and they're like, uh, like, you know, leaning back, like, chastity, someone shoot me. You're like, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? And then halfway through the talk, they're leaning forward. And then they're like three fourths away. They're got their hands on their knees. And then by the end, they're like secrets to women feed me. Like (laughs) I'll take any help I can get. Right. Men. Is there a manual men? Is there a formula? How do you pursue a woman in the 21st century? Yep. That's right. They're all like, I could take, I would take one of those. Yep. Thank you. I would love that. We miss each other. Guys, here we go. Ladies, tell me if this doesn't help the men understand the inner workings of the female mind a little bit. When the men look and go, what? This is just helps, right? It's Friday night, typical Friday night. We've all been there. Sweats. No other option. Sweats. Group of girlfriends. Stack of DVDs. Chick flick takes approximately three hours to figure out which three we're going to watch, but we will figure it out. We figure it out. And then we have our box of little Debbie's. I mean, both of our boxes of little Debbie's and we're not sharing and, uh, game on, put on the first one. You're like, yes, this is so good. Why don't we do this every night? And then you're like, throw on the sequel. Number two, you're like, yes. And the credits roll and you're like, well, my life is worthless. Let's do the third one, right? (laughs) Yes. So you throw on the third one, it's like 2 a.m. And, you know, finally watch this last one and the blue screen comes up, you know, the credits are rolling and you get up and you take your remote control and you chuck it against the wall and you're like, when's it going to be my turn? (laughs) I am so sick and tired of waiting for Mr. Right, Mr. Perfect to walk into my life. I need a cute guy 
and a sunset and a horse right now. <laughs> and all the girls are like, oh girl, you just said that out loud. And you spend the rest of the night just venting about him and him and him and this and this and this. And you go to bed bitter and frustrated and out of oatmeal cream pies. <laughs> Monday morning rolls around and you see this guy that you're halfway attracted to. And he's like, hey. And you're like, hey, I want you. <laughs> okay, so what do you do, ladies? Obviously, you start mentally stalking him. It's so funny. I love putting this slide up because like, guys, awkward giggling means it's true. Every time, the whole talk, okay? So when you hear high-pitched giggling, that's the women confirming my talk, okay? Good, awesome. Mentally stalking. You know, all the guys are like, hmm, I'm creeped out, don't even really know the definition. <laughs> creeped out. Mental stalking. You're like, is he gonna be there? I don't know. Like, did he smell like aqua de joy? I think that was aqua de joy. I think so. Oh, am I our first date? And then the wedding proposal or the marriage proposal in our wedding. Like I have the dress picked out. It's all on a secret board. He just has to push play and go. Mental stalking. And then you go to social media stalking. Guys, do you hear it? <laughs> Guys do it too though. They're like, I'm not laughing. I swear I'm not laughing. You jump on and look at 1,455 pictures of him and his Uncle Bill on his fishing trip. And you're like, that's the cutest golden retriever I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> and there's like a picture of him with his arm around a girl. And you're like, oh, that better be his sister. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> this front row is like guilty right here. <laughs> then you start flirting. It's like, okay, I'm going to go do that. And then you start texting. It's my favorite part of the talk. Did you hear how deathly silent the entire room went? It's like texting, dun, dun, dun. There's nothing funny about that word. <laughs> texting, is that not the most emotionally charged word? Texting, good for relationships, bad for relationships. Show me, show me both. I love it. It's like, everyone's like, mm, seven o'clock. I don't know, you know, like. I usually ask high schoolers, they're like, it's great. And they're like, college students are like, down with texting. <laughs> okay, it's charged, right? We'll leave it with it's charged for now. Then you start calling, 2 a.m., phone on speaker, on the pillow, like he's there, right? <laughs> Awkward giggling. Okay, good. Then you start calling, and then you start physically stalking him, right? <laughs> okay. My friends, this is what I call the emoto coaster. And the reason why I call it the emoto coaster is it's kind of like a roller coaster. You guys all been to like Six Flags, the world's of fun, and you're in line, you've convinced your friends the four hour wait is going to be worth it, and you're like, yes, this is going to be epic. And you get on the ride and you're waiting, waiting, you finally get there, strapped in, up the mountain, ching, 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 ching. Yes. You get to the top and it throws you over and your stomach comes up and your head is going back and forth and you have whiplash and your tears streaming down your face. And if you're a female, you have a permanent hole in the back of your head from your earring that just dug into your skin. <laughs> we all have that. And then the ride comes to this grinding halt and you take one step off the ride and throw up in front of everyone. And you spend the rest of the day by a shady tree in a trash can wondering why that was a good idea. Don't raise your hand. Have you ever been in this relationship before? Have you ever seen this relationship happen before? Mental stalking, social media stalking, flirting, texting, calling, physically stalking. It's the emoticoaster, right? It can move in five days. It can move in five weeks. It can move in five years. Please, Lord Jesus, let that be our reality. But do you guys see it? It happens all the time. Now, remember, I'm not a hater. You know, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, I love it all. Sarah Swafford, 18, like I'm not a hater. But are there some potential traps maybe with all of these? Yeah. Mental stalking. I'm going to read it in case you can't see it. It's a one-way relationship. You're building the unknown. Expectations can be too high and it can be creepy. Social media stalking. You're getting into someone's personal life and making assumptions. Wouldn't you rather let that person tell you about himself or herself? Flirting. You may be seeking attention, filling an insecurity, or sending mixed messages. It can come across as fake. Don't you want them to get to know the real you? Texting, it can be intimate, misinterpreted. You can rationalize things as no big deal and it can be addictive. Amen? True slide. Calling, you may stay up late, reveal a lot about yourself and calling and texting can both be very private. 
physically stalking. You have to be around them. You don't have any fun without them. You do things just because they do. You may change who you are to please them and start going to things just because they're there. It's easy to wrap yourself up in something for the wrong reasons. Physical stalking, when you saw it, it probably was like the puppy dog, like he or she just follows them around. But it means something different, doesn't it? Like That's really hard for high schoolers to not start dating someone and just completely change everything. You guys ever had that best friend where you do everything together, they're always around, and then one day they're just gone? It's like, where did he go? Or where did she go? And then you find out they're dating someone, they're like, oh, I bet I know where he is. (laughs) He's probably at her house. (laughs) We've all had it. There's just, there's some potential traps. The emoticoaster, it just has people spinning. The world's idea perfect just spins you right onto the emoticoaster. And the reason why it makes me nervous is because for years, I've just watched it all play out. And it always ends up with the cycle of use. You guys have probably heard it before, you know, where like men will use love to get sex and women will use sex to get love. Men will emotionally use women and their need or desire for love or romance or feeling anything, feeling wanted, feeling desired to get what they want, which is sex. And women will use sex or their bodies, what they know they have, what they have to offer, what they know that men want. They will use that in order to get love or to feel wanted, or to not feel alone, or to feel anything. It's a cycle of use, and it just goes round and round. The problem is, we never use the word use. It's just not a word in our vocabulary. Repeat after me, use. Use. I will not let you use me, and I will not use you. Do you feel the power in that word? Does this text ever go out? Hey, um, cute guy, I kind of know. I just had this whole, like, six-hour chick flick mar- movie marathon, and um, I was just wondering if you wanted to, like, come over for a couple hours and cuddle. Um, I just need to use you for a little while. Like, would that be okay? Like, does that text go out? It, it, everyone's like, hmm. Well, the text goes out, but is the word use in it? No. Right? How about this one? Hey, girl, I kind of know. I've just been looking at porn for a couple hours, and your face came into my mind, and I got on and looked at all your pictures on social media, and I was wondering if I could just use you for 20 minutes later tonight. Would that be okay? Does that text go out? God forbid, worst pickup line ever. (laughs) But does that text go out? Heck, yes, it does. But is the word use in it? No. Close your eyes for a minute. Everybody close your eyes. I want you to think of a time in your life where you were used either emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Or think about a time in your life where you use someone else, either emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Or a time where you watched your best friend be used emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Or a time where you watched your best friend use someone else, and you you watched it, and you couldn't do anything about it, but you knew it. Okay, I want you to open your eyes. Those are four of the heaviest questions that I could ask you or that you could ask me. Because there's not a single person in this room that hasn't been affected by use. But there's not a single person in this room that wants to use others or wants to be used. No one. It's not how we're made. But the world's idea perfect and the emoticoaster and the cycle of use just spin. And we have to call it out. Repeat after me, use. Use. I will not let you use me. And I will not use you. I told the men earlier, is there anything, ladies, anything more romantic than a man looking you in the eye and saying, I will not use you? I'm going to go with no. Like, I will not use you. Do you feel the power in that? How about the power in some guy or girl trying to make a play on you or, you know, try to feed you lines or try to call you up and, you know, just all of the games that are played. How about, how about the power in, I'm sorry, I, I can't let you use me. I'm sorry, like, you, you can't use me. Do you feel the power in that sentence? We have to call out the cycle of use, yeah? How are we going to do it? I'm tired. Like, for years, I swept up broken pieces of people. The cycle of use, you all know, you, you all feel it, you all know it. 
and I'm done. You too? There has to be a better way. It's the 80-20 problem and it's big three. If you're single, and I've been there before, you have the 80-20 problem and it's big three. You spend, I'm kind of joking, but you might fall on the 60% scale or the 90% scale, but you spend 80% of your time worrying, agonizing, planning, worrying some more about these three questions. Who am I going to date and eventually marry? What is he or she going to do for me? And how is he or she going to make me feel? And how good can I look doing it? Right or wrong? Who am I going to date and eventually marry? What is he or she going to do? And how is he going to make me feel? Or is she going to make me feel? And how good can I look doing it? Would you say that sometimes 80% of your mental energy, prayer, all of the above, goes into those three questions? Is it hard not to let it go to 80%? I was there, you guys. I know how scary it is to not know your vocation or to not know who you're going to be with or to not know if you should be this person or what they're going to do for you. I know. I remember. But here's the deal. I want you to look at that 80% and I want you to wonder what to do with this other little 20%. See that little 20%? This is what I want you to do. I want you to flip it with these three questions. Who do I want to be? What am I living for? And who am I living for? Who do I want to be? What am I living for? And who am I living for? If you can answer those three, if those three take up 80% of your time, I will let you mentally stalk your little heart out for that other 20 little percent. Go, girl. Just jump on Instagram. Go. I'm kidding. Do you understand what I'm saying? We got to flip it around. I don't want you to spin your wheels. Because the time that you have right now as a single person is a gift. And I know you want to like drop, kick me out of this room for saying that. I know. You're like, girl, this is not a gift. Grab a box of Oreos. I will tell you why. (laughs) I know. But I want you to look at these three questions and give them a shot. And the reason why I want you to give them a shot is because I want you, ladies, this is your new motto. Strive to become the woman of your dreams and you'll attract the man of your dreams. If I asked you, ladies in the room, who are you? What are you about? What do you live for? Who do you live for? What do you want to be? Do you guys see it? When that you know, guy comes along and everything, time, God, and chemistry, like fireworks, like when that guy comes along or when that girl comes along in your life, who are they going to be falling in love with? I want you to know who that person is. That's what singlehood is about, is figuring out who you are. Ladies, strive to be this woman, the woman of your dreams, and the man that God has prepared for you, if you're called to marriage, is going to be so ridiculously attracted to her, not to who you're not, not to who you used to be, but to you. And guys, what kind of man are you striving to be? All my girls that line up and say they're going to die with a hundred cats, like, I need you to answer this question. I need you to ask this question because I need you to be ready because there isn't an altar switch. You know, the altar switch. Everyone, I remember wanting there to be one. I'm sure you do too. You get in your beautiful white wedding gown and he's in his handsome tux, right guys? And I mean, she picked it out, but he's in it, right? So, and they're standing before God and everyone they love and they say, I do. And then they go around the back of the altar and they flip the switch, like a little light switch. And instantly they become the man or the woman that they've always longed to be. Instantly. The altar switch. Is that how it works? Does the, does the baggage and the drama and all of the pain and all of the suffering and all the wounds, does it just like magically go away and you're instantly the man or the woman that you've always longed to be? But it just doesn't work like that. Every decision you make today is taking you closer or farther away from the man or the woman that you want to be. Preparing for that altar starts today. What you do now matters. Don't let anyone tell you differently. I know it's college and you just want to live it up and make memories. And I know, you know, I know what that's like to want to just like let go and just like whatever. But people are counting on you. You can't see, if you're called to marriage, you can't see your future spouse, but do they exist? Do your fun little kids, like, are they going to be there someday ready for you, needing you? Needing the dad they've always, you know, always wanted, the dad they've always needed, needing the mother they've always wanted. Like, they're counting on you. And like, that's you right now preparing to be that. Don't waste time. Amen. When I was in college, I remember all this talk. Remember the whole, like when girls awkwardly giggle, it's true. 
Like, it's easy for me to stand on the stage and give this talk. Why? Because I experienced all of this. Do you understand? Like, this is easy to talk about. I've been there. And I was in college, and I had a professor say, okay, um, can people give me uh, some virtues? Shout out some virtues. And I remember thinking, patience is a virtue. And that's all the farther I got. But I remember as he was talking about it, light bulbs started going off. And I was like, whoa, this man has some answers. Hang with me here. Virtue, striving for human excellence. Virtue is forming the habits of knowing and choosing the good and right thing to do. Virtue harnesses and trains your passions and emotions to work towards the good. Virtue gives you the freedom to love. It held answers for me. This word virtue, it was mysterious to me. I didn't know exactly what I meant, but I knew it's what I wanted. What I've come to see is emotional virtue is so helpful. The right ordering of our thoughts and actions and desires as they relate to our relationships. This can be an anticipation of a future relationship in the midst of one or in dealing with the aftermath of one that has ended. Don't raise your hand. Anybody been through a really, really hard breakup? Anyone going through one right now? Don't raise your hand, just in your head. Breakups are probably one of the hardest things in life. I mean, that, I know for me, I know for a lot of people, like, that was one of the hardest things like, you've ever had to go through. Emotional virtue is where it's at. What is it? Uh, Sarah, I know what emotions are. I, I think I kind of know what virtue is, but like, what? It's just applying virtue to your emotions and your passions. Ladies, do your emotions ever get you in trouble? Men, do your passions and emotions ever get you in trouble? They're like, hmm, I have to think about what the one, but yeah, right? I'm trying to get the word out that men are not just sexual robots, correct? Do you have emotions, men? Good. Ladies, did you hear that? Good. So we're just clarifying lots of things today. Lots of clarification. Men and women struggle with a lot of the same things. But what were to happen if we were to apply virtue to those emotions, to those passions? I remember I was in college, and this was all starting to swirl. We had the courage to ask a group of our guy friends, what's the most attractive thing about a woman? We were like, be gentle, you know? We're like, what's the most attractive thing about a woman? And so they got into their man huddle. I think you guys have probably all seen a man huddle, you know, where they, like, get together, and they put their arms around each other like this, and they start swaying back and forth, you know? And there's typically lots of grunting. So they're over in this man huddle for like 10 minutes. And we're like, this is going to be good. Like, they're really talking about it. And so we were like, come back. And we're like, what? Like, okay, most attractive thing about a woman, you know? So we were like all ready for it. And they're like, okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. Most attractive thing about a woman, holiness and confidence. And we were like, holiness and confidence. That's, that's deep. That's wonderful. And I remember they were like, yeah, even guys that aren't into their faith would say they want a girl like knows who she is and does the right thing. And we were like, oh, Excellent. Okay, great. Thanks. Glad we asked. Okay. And then I remember we went back to our dorm rooms and one of my friends like chucked her coat against the wall and she was like, great. Why did we even ask? Like we asked, they told us, and we don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, Go hither, go be holy and confident. Okay. Watch us go. Like, <laughs> and like we were kind of mad cause it was hard. It was like, what did I, I have no idea how to do that. We know what they want, and we don't even know how to be that or what that means. Like, talk about taking 15 steps backwards. I thought I just had to lose 20 pounds and dye my hair. This whole holiness and confidence thing, like, what? And I remember we went back to them, and we were like, okay, we're going to need some help here. Could you give us, like, some examples, um, practical tips and tools for what exactly you mean by that? So the guys, they started a list and, like, started... To be honest, it was virtues. They started lists of things that like make up what this woman, what they were talking about. And so, of course, you know, women, we made, we started making our list. So I call, I call her the simply irresistible virtuous woman, and the simply irresistible virtuous man. Would you like to see them? I'm sorry, it's so small. I'll read it. The simply irresistible virtuous woman. She is feminine. She is confident, and she is committed. She's feminine. She's gentle and kind, graceful and sincere, patient and flexible doesn't gossip, isn't rude, tries to eliminate drama, not create it. She's poised and modest, open to the needs of others. She's nurturing and welcoming, joyful and fun. She's confident. She stands up for what is right and seeks the truth. She has courage and is not afraid to confront and help someone. She's genuinely excited for another, not jealous or vain. She speaks with conviction. She's responsible, prudent, humble and honest, secure, and sensitive to the needs of others. 
Her relationship with God comes first in her life. She puts others first before herself. She strives for excellence in all things, in chastity and sobriety, and tries her hardest in academics or her career. She's not led solely by her emotions or passions. She maintains balance and order in life. She lives a life of charity and service. She's forgiving, trustworthy, loyal, and pure. Okay, so all the women in the crowd, I just need you to take a deep breath in, for real, and let it out. One more time, all the ladies, in and out. Okay, men, little note, when we read lists like this, we have to control from hyperventilating because we look at lists like this and it's not, oh, can't wait to be here. It's, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that. I just completely overwhelmed every female in this room, okay? So everyone, deep breath in, girls, deep breath in, let it out. Repeat after me, striving, striving, not perfect because perfect doesn't exist. Striving. Deep breath in. Let it out. Guys, you see how we work? This is how we work, okay? (laughs) Striving. This woman doesn't exist. Mary's in heaven, okay? So here's the deal. She doesn't exist. Guys, don't go looking for her because she's not going to be here. What is simply irresistible is a woman that is striving to be this woman. All the women, nod your head up and down. You're following me, yeah? Don't freak out. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. This is a good list, okay? Gentlemen, is this woman attractive? One more time, just so they can hear you. Is this woman attractive? Good. Ladies, feel it. Feel it. Okay, good. Ladies, would you like to see the man? (laughs) The simply irresistible man. He's masculine. He's a leader, provider, protector, initiator. He's chivalrous, brave and courageous. Gentle and respectful, intuitive and patient, joyful and fun. And if you see confident and committed, those lists are the exact same as the women's because we share humanity. Okay, guys, don't have to go through breathing treatments. You know, typically they're just like, okay, I knew it was going to be painful, but uh, (laughs) it's up there. Okay, ladies, is this man attractive? Just so they can hear you, is this man attractive? How about a little hoot and hollering? Yes, I heard it. Wow! This is very important, okay? That the men understand that this is what you're looking for. Because what typically happens after my talks is this. Guys will come up to me afterwards and they're like, Sarah, can we talk to you? I'm like, yeah, it'd be great. Over there? Like, over here? Okay, yeah. Like, in the dark corner? Okay, in the dark corner. All right, good. So we're all in the dark corner, right? And we're all, all the guys, like 15 guys, and they're like, are you sure this is what the women want? I'm like, yeah, I mean, you heard the hooting and hollering. It was pretty awesome. They were pretty stoked. Are you sure this is what the women want? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, I think so. Yeah, I've been years of the list. Yeah, mm-hmm. Then why do women throw themselves half naked at guys that are the complete opposite? Dark corner got darker. <laughs> All the guys out there, they're like... I say that because I don't always have the greatest answer for that. But when I look at them in that dark corner, I usually go something like this. You know what? She throws herself at people, at men, because she's broken. Because she's been wounded. Because she has pains in her life that are not healed. Because she probably has a dad that didn't love her the way he should have. Because she's been on the Emoto coaster and the world's idea perfect has her completely out of sorts. And the cycle of use has left her hurting. And that's why that happens. Confident women, simply irresistible confident women do not throw themselves half naked at men because they know that their worth comes from our Lord and they see their identity through his eyes. And they can look at men and say, I won't let you use me and I won't use you. But not everyone has the freedom to do that because every single person in this room has felt the pain of the cycle of use of our lives. I give this talk for a reason, you guys. Like, a lot of us, many of us have been there before. And it wasn't until college I found myself on a retreat. And I went into, you know, typical retreat style, into the confessional. You know, like, there's, like, crying, and then there's, like, sobbing, and then there's, like, snotting, okay? So I find myself in this confessional, and I laid out this talk to this priest, and I just laid it out. I'm tired, I'm exhausted from not being perfect. I'm tired of trying to be what everybody wants me to be. I'm tired, and I'm empty, and I'm hollow. Now, I'll never forget it. This priest said, Sarah, this is what I want you to do. 
The best dating advice I ever got was from a priest on a retreat. So when people tell you priests don't know what's up about relationships, he goes, drop, kick. Okay, good. He says to me, Sarah, this is what I want you to do. I want you to run. I want you to run to our Lord, and I want you to fall into his arms. And I want you to lay everything that you're going through, your past, your wounds, your brokenness, everything. I want you to lay it all at his feet. And I want you to fall into his arms. I want you to let him love you. And then when you're strong and you're whole and you've been healing, I want you to stand up and I want you to run with him. And when you're, you've been running, I want you to glance to the side and see who's running with you. And that's who you're supposed to be with. And you guys, that wasn't just dating advice. Like, that changed my life. Because for the first time in my life, it wasn't about what I had to do, what I had to be, how I had to perfect myself, even for God. I would go to God and say, I just got to change this, change that, do this, lose 10 pounds, and I'll present myself to you, Lord, like the perfect Sarah, and then you will love me. Do you guys know how backwards that is? Like, that's not how our Lord works at all. He wants you to bring all to him and lay it down and let him love you. It's, it's the opposite. You have nothing to prove to him. Right? That's the love of our Lord in the confessional. Drop it off. Lay it at his feet. Let him love you like no man or no woman can. And then run. That's where it's at. And that whole, this whole idea of dating and like everything that you're learning this weekend and everything that's coming at you, it has to go on a foundation. And then we have these steps. I love it. I call it the natural progression of a relationship. NPR. Natural progression of a relationship. Make it a household name. Acquaintances. True friends. Defining the relationship. Having a DTR. Dating. Courting. Engagement. And marriage. Most 21st century relationships have three steps. Meet, hook up, move in together. It's typically how it goes. I would like to propose a few more steps, if you're all okay with that. Um, I really like the natural progression relation for a mil- million reasons. Number one, acquaintances. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you, right? You may have met them for the first time or you've known them your whole life. True friends. Number two. Might be the most important step on the entire thing. Ready? Females, all you ladies out there, I need you to find your female posse. Posse, same path, same place. Same, go in the same direction. I need you to find a posse. Women hate each other. This is going to be very hard. Okay? Do I exaggerate? No. Okay. Women have been hurt by other women. You don't want to be a chess piece in someone else's game. I understand. I need you to be vulnerable. I need you to go to the women and say, you know that talk and you know that list and like all that stuff? I cannot do this alone. I need you, women, to find your posse. Men, it is so important. I need you to find your male posse. Guys come to me all the time like, I love you. I love your talk. I have no friends. I love you. I love your talk. I don't know a guy that loves Jesus. Am I right, guys? I know what that's like. But I need the men to have that posse of other men because the, okay, the women's posse and the men's posse, I need you to, like, spend time together. What typically happens, you know, like when you meet someone or you typically, you just go on a date, right? You just, you meet someone, you go on a date. Do you know how many checks are in there when the female posse and the male posse get together? I mean, if a guy or a girl approaches you and they could be from 7 p.m. to midnight, they can be anybody you want. I mean, knight in shining armor, like woman of wonderful, they can be anyone from 7 to midnight and then go back to being whoever they were at 6.59. What is it like to hang out with him and his guy friends? What is it like to hang out with her and her girlfriends? What is he like around women that he's not interested in? Is she chivalrous to all women or just to the one that he's interested in? Do you see all those checks and how that works? I need you to be friends. Like, women, I need you to be with the women so you don't run into the arms of a man when something goes wrong. Guys, same thing. But more importantly, I need you to be friends with the opposite sex before you try to date any of them. It's huge. Learn how to love someone as a friend. Do you see how the use just totally goes away? What were to happen if the simply irresistible woman that's striving for that and the simply irresistible man that's striving for that not only were friends, but then eventually went on to date? That's what I want for you. That's why the friendship groups are so important because they're checks for each other. And then you have the DTR, super important, two DTRs. All the men in the crowd, repeat after me, sincerity and clarity. So manly. One more time. Sincerity and clarity. 
DTR. Defining the relationship. I call it the gray area. We're just talking. We just text. I mean, we're just hanging out. Do you all just talk, text, and hang out? And then hook up and repeat? Welcome to college. I was on an East Coast school, and I said, what's dating like around here? And this girl was like, well, I mean, people typically just hook up until the guy deems the girl worthy to, like, be seen in public with her and spend money on her, and then I guess they're just dating. And then I guess you could call it dating. It's like, I think I just threw up in my mouth. <laughs> but that's how it is on college campuses. I'm tired of the gray area. Anyone else? Just talking, texting, and hanging out. Like, what the heck does that mean? I'm glad you talk and text and hang out, but it means something different. When it comes to the opposite sex, it means something different. So I want to try to eliminate the gray area, and you do that with DTR, and there's two. First, DTR. Okay, so what typically happens is the two posses are together, and all of a sudden you keep finding yourself like still talking when the rest of the posse is left. Guy and girl still talking. I think something might be going on here. Time, chemistry, and God. Something good's happening, right? Men, I need you to be able to have that first DTR. Hey, I'd really like to get to know you better. Intentions have been stated. Ladies, you can decide whether or not you accept or whatever. Clarity is the important thing. I always say, if they say no, like, you have clarity. Move on. The most important thing you can do is not wait around because you might be waiting for someone that just wants to be your friend and miss the person that wants to date you. Nod your head up and down if you're following me. Good, good, good. Okay, so first DTR. I think something's going on. Second DTR, very important. Do you think maybe we should move towards dating Do you guys see how there's, like, there's two DTRs? I'm interested in you. Like, I would love to kind of get to know you better. And then second DTR, I think we're called to date. This is exciting. Okay, so you see the difference there. Now, dating and courting. Everyone's like, there is no difference. We have to have a little bit of a difference because of the 21st century. Dating and courting. Tell me if there's a difference between dating, hey, I'd really like to get to know you better, spend more time with you, like, see what's going on, versus courting, which is, I think I'm called to marry you. Okay, a little bit of a difference, maybe. I mean, it depends on who you are. Um, But yeah, here's the problem. I was joking with the guys earlier. Guys, it'll take guys two weeks to get the nerve to ask a girl to coffee. And then they sit down at coffee and she's like, yes, and I would like a white house with a picket fence, five children. And if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, either one, I'm totally fine with either one. (laughs) Dating is not a marriage proposal. DTRs are not marriage proposals. You can date someone and go, I just don't think we're called to date anymore, and be able to go, I think we're just called to be friends. DTRs have to be super, super clear. Everybody repeat after me, sincerity and clarity. clarity. In it to win it, right? Okay, good. Engagement. So you go from courting, I think we're called to marriage, to engagement. Do engagements get called off? Should more engagements get called off? Okay, I know it's hard. You get engaged. There's a ring. It's like, let's just move in together. It's easier. Let's get a dog. Like, I want to plant. Let's practice. Look, it's going to be great. Let's just combine everything. I'm so tired. I mean, here's the thing. If you're living together and sleeping together, all that, it's all blind to you. And then you wake up one morning and you're married and it's like, you know, 500 invitations were in the mail. I couldn't get out. I, my, my dress was hanging in my closet. I couldn't back out. Like, our bank accounts are joined. Like, I didn't know what to do. Don't ever get trapped in that. Promise me that you'll never say to yourself, like, I can't do any better. I'll never find another guy. I'll never find another girl. Like, I'm in too deep. That's not how marriages can start. All those decisions start way back in true friends. Amen? The natural progression of a relationship is there not only to protect your heart, but to protect the heart of the person that you're going to be with if you're called to marriage. Amen? So here's our plan today forward. Know what sends you onto the emoticoaster. You know your heart. You know your pitfalls. You know the movies and you know the images. You know where your passions and your emotions are. Know what sends you there. Call out the cycle of use. Repeat after me, use. Use. I will not let you use me. And I will not use you. Power. Strive to become the woman of your dreams and the man you're called to be. Rock that simply irresistible list of virtues. Run to our Lord, lay it all down at his feet, and protect and respect one another. Men and women, protect and respect one another. Follow the natural progression of a relationship. I'm so excited for you guys. One of my favorite things is to be able to look at you all right now, you and me right here. I get excited for you. You know why? Because your entire future is in front of you. 
And it's things like seek, it's things like focus conferences where you take a deep look in your life and you go, yep, like I am dropping that off and I'm starting over. And I'm finding a posse, I'm getting out of my comfort zone, and I'm gonna walk up to people that I might not know and I'm gonna say, hi, I would like you to be in my posse. If that weirds you out, go talk to Sarah Swafford about it. Like, <laughs> this is what I want for you. I'm excited for you. Push that reset button, it doesn't matter where you are, even if you feel like you're doing all right, like, reset, I'm ready for a new life. I spent the last two years and lots of nap times writing this book. I would go to coffee with you. I would go take you to dinner. If I had two or three hours with you, I would give this plus a million things more. But I sat down and wrote this. It is straight from my heart. I really wrote it just because I don't want the cycle of use to attack you. I want something so different for your heart. And so I wrote this book. It's all in here. But this book is this talk and so much more. And I really, since I can't be with you at coffee, like, I want to be with you at coffee. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group of people, these excellent, holy, virtuous, striving men and women. I feel it in the room, Lord, like the Holy Spirit just continues to blow my mind in the way, the eagerness, and the hunger that each of us have, not only for you, but for something different. We know the hookup culture's out there. We know the world is attacking us. We see it. Help this talk to not die in our hearts. Help it to be a conversation. I pray for each one of these students that they're able to look at the people around them and rally their posses. I pray for strength that the men will find other men and that the women will find other women. And in a special way, I pray for their vocations. I pray for their spouses, if they're called to marriage, that they can see them with the eye of their heart, especially when they're making tough decisions as they're trying to grow in virtue. I thank you for the opportunity to be with them here this weekend, and I ask that you continue to just rock our world, whether it's in the confessional or an adoration tonight, whether it's in a talk or just spending time with one another. Help us to see you, because you are the fulfillment of every desire that we have. And we praise you and we love you as we pray together. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Love you guys. God bless you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you know others who need to hear this, please burn copies of the CD and share it with as many people as you wish. Also, to spread this message to your community, visit chastityproject.com, where you can bring Sarah to speak at your event and can obtain her book, Emotional Virtue, for as little as $2 in bulk.